The following program is sponsored by the Today's Home Remodeler Television Network. Welcome to today's Home Remodeler. I'm Stuart Keith and on today's show, well, we're looking at heating and cooling options for your home. We'll begin with our heating and cooling specialist, Larry Hacker from Temperature Systems, as he explains what you should expect from a contractor when getting an estimate. Next, we'll discuss the various components that comprise a forced air heating system. And we'll finish up seeing what maintenance you and a professional can do to keep your system operating at its peak efficiency. So we have a lot to cover today, and we'll get started after these messages. No matter where you live here in the upper Midwest, chances are either you or someone you know uses a forced air furnace to provide comfort during our long cold winters. And sooner or later, that heating system will need to be replaced. So on today's show, we'll walk through the process for doing just that, including getting an estimate, selecting the proper equipment, and we'll even share some maintenance ideas to keep your system operating at its peak efficiency. So let's get started with our HVAC specialist, Larry Hacker, from Temperature Systems. Well, Larry, beautiful location here, nice home. The homeowners have decided to replace their furnace. Let's explain what's involved in that process and specifically what to expect in an estimate. Okay, first thing, it's very important that we actually get to sit down with the individuals that occupy the home so that we can determine their needs and actually do a needs analysis. Really, the homeowner should be expecting to spend some time with the heating contractor. It's very important for the heating contractor to learn from the homeowner what their lifestyle is. What temperature do they like for the daytime as well as at night? Do they have areas of the home that may or may not heat or cool properly? To be able to come in and actually do a good load calculation on the building so that we know truly what size product we should be putting in for that particular situation. So really, a lot of communication. You're saying have the homeowners meet with the contractor. So set aside some time and walk through the house, is it fair to say, yeah. while the contractor is taking notes down? Yeah, very important. If we didn't get to meet with the homeowners, we wouldn't be able to find out if there was an area that wasn't heating or cooling properly. Do they have allergies? Do they have environmental concerns for humidity or, or dehumidification? So I should be thinking ahead of time, are there any cold spots? What's the temperatures I like? What, have I done any remodeling? That probably comes into play as well. Oh, it very much so comes into play. If they have done any upgrades to the home, that's going to drastically change, in most cases, the size of the furnace that's going to be needed to heat the home in a positive way. If they've added insulation, if they've upgraded windows, that's going to make their home more weather tight, which in turn is going to reduce the heat loss of the home so we can get by with smaller equipment it's going to increase the efficiencies then of the home itself. So obviously it's very important to meet with your heating contractor, set aside the hour that it might take, but it's going to be well worth it in the operation and comfort of the system. Definitely. So let's just walk through this home. You have a nice big wall of windows here. Looks very beautiful, but is it challenging from a heat loss calculation? It's something we have to consider. It's not challenging, but it's something that definitely adds to the heat loss of the home. Really what we would do is measure each window determine what their physical area is, and it's important that we find out what direction does that glass face, because obviously in the wintertime, if we're going to gain a lot of heat from the sun, that's an important factor to understand. And in this case, do they have draperies or blinds? If they don't, you have a lot higher heat loss through those same pieces of glass than the individual that has a good quilted blind. It makes a big difference on what heat loss is going to occur in that home. Well, it's amazing how much different factors influence the heating and cooling abilities of a system. Definitely. And then when you look here, this actually faces east, so there's not a whole lot. It's just morning sun coming in, but they also have a covered wraparound porch. Yeah, and that's an important detail. With that being covered, you're really never going to get any direct solar gain through these windows on the lower level. The upper you would, but not down below. Okay, east side, move to the south. They have a sunroom there. A few less windows, but windows just the same. Exactly. Sunroom definitely comes into play, and again, that's important to talk to the homeowner. How do they use that? Are they expecting that to be conditioned 
to the proper temperature all of the time or are they going to understand that when the sun's shining in on them that's going to be warmer than the temperatures they're trying to maintain within the rest of the home in the winter time. Okay so lots of factors that can influence the performance of a system down the road. Okay so the contractor's walking around with the homeowner taking notes down. What's the next step in the process? What as a homeowner should I expect to get in return? A couple different things. One first off from all of the notes as well as taking all of the measurements of the home. Typically the heating contractor is going to be doing a load calculation to determine the exact size because after those upgrades we talked about it's going to make a difference on the heat loss that we really have now today in the home. The next step in the process is taking those details and the load calculation so that the heating contractor can do a good job in putting together the proper proposal based on their specific needs. Are there areas of the home that have to heat a certain way? That's something that we have to take into account as well. And then one of two things are going to happen. They'll either do that on site with today's technology or potentially go back to the office, do the calculations, and either schedule a second appointment or mail the proposal. So Larry, down here at this existing furnace, it's going to be replaced. From a visual aspect, when I'm replacing my existing furnace, what can I expect to see? Typically now, it's going to be even a smaller furnace. So there would be a transition from the plenum down to where the new furnace sits. And you would see any updates to vent piping needs or transitions yet from the ductwork back into the furnace. Sure, and you mentioned the vent piping because let's say I have an older furnace, weren't those metal vented say 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, 20, 30 years ago, even today, there's still some metal vented furnaces out there. In that case, they would have to upgrade the venting away from the metal that went out through a chimney to PVC that is now typically going to exit the house through the sidewall. Does a homeowner have any say where you're exiting the PVC piping? To a degree they do, in that we don't want it exiting in front of the home or underneath a window. We do still have some requirements to be set back away from gas meters and things like that by code that we will still follow. So it seems to me it comes back to that meeting with the contractor, making sure you're there and discussing all the different options you have, whether it's the components or whether it's the placement of the components or venting. Exactly. Okay, we touched on that this was a humidifier, that's a great example of an add-on, very important in the winter, I know. Mm -hmm. What about other add-ons? Is this a good time to be talking to your contractor? I mean, since he's on site? Yeah, it makes the most sense to do it while they're there rather than having them to have to come back and do a second trip. They could find out right away, is the humidifier operable? If not, now would be the right time to put a new one in. Or in the case here where they have filtration, we have good filters, expandable media already here. There is the base, two inch disposable or one inch disposable that a lot of people see. That would be your, your entry. This would be an upgrade to mid-tier. And then a further enhancement now is an electronic that actually has capture and kill technology, which means the airborne particles that the homeowners are irritated by are gonna be trapped on the filter and they're actually gonna be killed to where they're inert when we go ahead and change those filters out. Boy, it seems to me you're developing a system around the lifestyle. If I either have asthma or kids with allergies, I mean, now's the time to really have a huge impact on my indoor air quality. And you think how much time we spend in our homes. Now's the time to be communicating with your contractor. Yeah, that's right, Stu. That's why it's very important to get all of the things out on the table with the contractor right away. And then they can have all of the proper things installed right at the start. Stay tuned, we'll look at the various equipment options next when we continue with today's Home Remodeler. In our last segment, we learned what to expect from a professional contractor when getting an estimate for a new forced air heating system. Now let's continue with our heating specialist, Larry Hacker, as he introduces the different equipment options out at the Temperature Systems Training Center. So Larry, we've completed our needs analysis with our contractor. We know we need a new furnace. There are some different choices as a homeowner you have to make. So in this segment, let's walk through the different choices and really help the homeowner get the best unit for their situation. In the upper Midwest, we typically look at 92 AFU and above. 
just because of the amount of usage we run on the gas side. So let's take a look at this. Our base model is 92 AFU and it uses a PSC motor, which is an AC drive motor that consumes electricity. So what that represents is for every dollar of fuel I put through this, 92 cents of every dollar is converted into true heat that's going to go into the home. Okay, so really the industry has evolved. I mean, it wasn't too many years ago. 92% was really the top of the spectrum. You're saying it goes all the way up to uh, almost what, 98, 98? 98, 98 and a half now is on our top model. But you also mentioned electricity with a gas-fired furnace. I really wasn't thinking that there were electrical costs. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that consumers today have to be aware of. The electrical consumption of today's furnaces is much higher in the entry level. And the advantage as you go up in model selections there's higher efficiency blower motors that save you considerable amount of money on the electrical side. Really? So even though we're talking about a gas-fired furnace, electricity, the electrical costs come into play in a big way? In a big way. What we're looking at with these three models, we're seeing a transition of cost. Running this furnace, you're going to be somewhere around $500 a year in electrical, up to seven, depending on its size. Whereas when we go up to the high tier, you're in the $50 to $100 per year. That's a huge cost savings, and I suppose a lot of that comes into play, uh, the cost per kilowatt. I mean, I'm at like $0.14, cents, I think, with my exactly. utility. Some of them are down $0.08, $0.07, cents, but regardless of that, it's a huge electrical cost. Mm -hmm. it's and really, huge. looking at the future, it's probably going to be even more expensive down it, the road. Yes, exactly what you said. Seven cents many years ago, now we're at 14. What's it going to be like another five or 10 years from now? Okay, so there's a large electrical cost to operating this. Even though it costs less up front, I take it, you have to take that into consideration when selecting a unit. Yes. Okay, so what's this one? This is about 96%? Right, our mid-tier models is about 96% AFU. So again, 96 cents of every dollar goes to heat the home. And we've incorporated ECM motors, which are gonna save electrically on the furnace. So we're gonna see a saving somewhere around a $300 savings upgrading to this on an annualized basis. Wow, $300 savings, that's quite a savings and a great payback. If you look at this as being an investment, which a homeowner should, look at their heating and cooling system as an investment, $300 a year, it wouldn't take long, I would imagine, to pay this off. Yes, the difference is, is very achievable for a quick payback. The other advantage, when we go to 96, we're also putting in two-stage furnaces. This is a single stage, it's on at 100%, this one comes on at 40% or ratchets up to 100% firing rate based on our needs. As it gets colder out, it would ramp up to high fire. If it's a warmer, mild fall day, it'll remain in low fire. So it better matches the heat output to the load of the house. Does that make the unit more efficient? Increases your comfort more than it does the efficiency. Instead of that hard blast of full heat, when you really don't need it all, it'll come on on a mild condition. Okay, so that's what we're really talking about here is comfort? Comfort is a big one. Because you're talking about running these motors not just during the heating season, but year-round? Sure. The year-round side would come to be able to basically clean your air 24-7, 365 days a year. That's what we recommend, and also that increases your overall comfort within the home as well, trying to alleviate some of those hot spots and cold spots that we all run into. Okay, this one right here, 98.5% you mentioned, mm -hmm. that's incredible. But I assume it's also more efficient electrically? Yeah, this is even the next step up, and it does two things for us. Electrically, it has our ultimate high-end motor, which is a full modulating blower motor, as well as there's an induction fan that's DC drive as well that moves the air through the furnace for combustion. The other thing this does is it has modulation of the gas. This is a two-stage. This starts at 40% and then modulates fully up to 100% when it needs to, based on how cold it is out. Wow, so a smart version of a furnace. It's actually doing the thinking based on the environment around it? Exactly, so it's looking at how much did I have to run the last time? What is my firing rate that I need to have? And ideally, in a perfect world, we'd never shut it off. It would just maintain, if you have it set to 70 degrees, it's 70 degrees all the time and it would regulate up and down. Consumers, though, have a perception it's costing them a lot of money in doing so. In reality, that's not the case. And how much would this cost to operate over the... The nice thing with this one is with the higher efficiency blower motors, you're going to see a saving somewhere between three to $500 from the ones we first talked about. Oh, really? So I assume that these cost more as you go up. Right. But there's a definite payback. If you're talking upwards of $500 annually, 
this might cost a couple thousand dollars more. So three to five years, you'd have a payback. If you're in your house longer than that, it's actually costing you a lot less to have exactly. a comfortable living exactly. environment. Regardless of how long you're in your home, you've got a great return on investment as you upgrade to a higher efficiency and especially to the higher efficiency electrical motors used. So there are a lot of different factors to consider. And what I'm getting out of it is, you know, you look at your needs analysis that you've discussed and developed with your contractor, and you think about your situation. Are you gonna be selling your house? If you're selling your house in the next year, you might not wanna put the most expensive furnace in there, even though the next occupants could reap the benefits. But, you know, if it's me, judging by the paybacks, three, four, five years down the road, I could go top of the line furnace as compared to putting the low end in, it's gonna pay for itself in that short time period, and then after that, I'm just reaping the benefits of indoor air quality, indoor air comfort, and a lot less operating costs. Down exactly, the road. with today's return on investment, it really makes sense if you're gonna be in your home for any length of time. The higher efficiency and the more electrical efficiency you can purchase, the better off you're gonna be for the long haul. Stick around, we'll share some maintenance tips that can keep your system operating at its peak efficiency. We continue with today's Home Remodeler. So far in today's show, we've learned what to expect from a professional contractor when getting an estimate for a new forced air heating system. We also saw some of the different heating equipment options that are currently available. Now let's finish up with our HVAC specialist, Larry Hacker, who shares some maintenance tips for keeping a forced air system operating at its peak efficiency. Now Larry, let's turn our attention to furnace maintenance and what a homeowner can do or should be doing in preparation for a heating season. The homeowners have a critical part in making sure that their system is gonna operate for the fall. Um, some things that they really want to look at first, obviously filter maintenance is always critical. They need to look at those depending on the type of filter every four to six weeks if it's a simple one inch disposable or in this case it's an expanded media which you can get by for a longer length of time before you have to check them. But they do need to be cleaned or replaced on an annual basis. And that's really a simple thing for the homeowner to do but it seems to me it's very important. It's very important. If we can't get airflow through that furnace they're not going to get heat upstairs and the cost involved to make that furnace operate with a very shortened airflow is going to go up for the homeowner. So proper maintenance there is critical. Another thing to look at on today's condensing furnaces, there will be a condensate drain line. And who knows in the summertime what happened. If the kids were down here playing, what have you, they might have dislodged it, moved it away from the floor drain. Certainly the homeowner is not going to want to come home to a puddle on the floor the first time they fire the furnace up. They might have water damage, things like that. That's something that a homeowner should be able to inspect and check to make sure that it's in the proper position. Something, again, very simple, but it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. and there's two other things that we want to look at. The first would be the venting outside. We have PVC that runs out the side of the home. Many times over the summer, things can happen. Birds can build nests, wasps can build nests in there. We need to make sure that those are all cleaned out or clear before we have operation taking place in the fall. The other thing would be the high-low returns in the home, if it's so equipped, we need to have the low returns opened for proper heating operation in the winter time. Sure, so not only with furnace maintenance, but safety, and while we're talking about safety, good time to check the batteries and your smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. Again, just be a prudent homeowner, understand how your system operates, and do what maintenance you recommend that a homeowner can do. Okay, comes time to call in a professional. We always say on a regular basis, what can I expect the professional contractor to do when he's cleaning the furnace? What a contractor is gonna be checking for is more internal at that point. They're gonna look at a hot surface igniter and do an inspection. They can actually test it to see how close it is to failing. 
If it's getting close enough, they will suggest to the homeowner that they should, as a maintenance item, have that repaired. The other thing we look at is the condensate drain internal to the furnace. There's a trap. It can get dirty over the course of time, whether it's bugs, whether it's dust and dirt. That's something that on a maintenance basis, and again, we recommend that being done by a heating contractor, should be taken care of, flushed and cleaned out, and put back in place. Finally, the main blower in the furnace should be inspected to make sure that it's clear. Most motors today are sealed bearings. The older motors, years gone by, we always used to have to oil them. You don't need to do that today. In addition, Stu, you can expect the contractor to do a battery of tests. What those would be would be to operate the furnace for a minimum of 15 minutes to do a full combustion analysis and CO test outside, being able to also check the cold air temperature as well as the discharge hot temperature to make sure that we have the proper temperature rise through the furnace to ensure proper performance. The other final things to look at is where we do have accessories like this, if you're having the maintenance done, they will typically look at a humidifier, determine if the panel is in good shape. If not, they will suggest replacing that as a maintenance item. They can take care of that for you. Also, they'll double check the filters to make sure that you've been doing a good job as a happy homeowner, making sure that they're clean. If not, again, they can do that service for the customer for an additional fee. Okay, what happens if I replace my furnace? I have a new furnace. Do I still need to have it inspected and cleaned on a regular basis? It's a good idea. A, the warranty for the furnace does stipulate that, and it doesn't matter what manufacturer, proper maintenance needs to be done. So it's a good idea to have them come back before the end of that first year to make sure that there's any little things that may have not been set correct or that have changed over the summer. They can go ahead and make those adjustments and answer any questions that the homeowner may have. And then after that, probably one or every, at least every two years? Yeah, definitely every other year for sure, if not every year, depending again on your particular needs as a homeowner. And if you have an air conditioning system, they can probably check that out if the conditions are right at the same time? Yeah, if, if it's still warm enough outside, they can actually take care of both of those opportunities at once. And then quickly, you touched on one of the add-ons there, a uh, humidifier. What about a heat recovery ventilator that these homeowners have? Is it yeah. a good time to clean it as well? Yeah, in this case, that would be great to inspect. Heat recovery ventilators, depending on the type, still have a condensate drain. And in the case of this one, you can see a hose coming down. We need to have those cleaned out, checked, make sure they're intact. There's filters internal to those the homeowner may not even know about, that those should be looked at. And there's a heat exchange media that gets taken out and cleaned off by the, the dealer or contractor at that point. And again, if there's any issues with the mechanics of it, they can take care of them at that time. Yeah, is there anything a homeowner can do in regards to a heat recovery ventilator? The filter maintenance could be done by the homeowner. The other thing is, is there is an exhaust and intake outside, and that can get covered up with dust and dirt over the summer. Those are things that need to be maintained throughout the year as well. Well, I tell you, just hearing you talk, if you're a homeowner and whether you have a heat recovery ventilator or any of the add-ons or simply just have a, a furnace in your house, there are some definite maintenance items you can do and some that need to be done by a professional. And if you follow those tips that you gave, it ensures that your system will operate for a good long time. That's for sure. The maintenance on them is critical to give you the optimal energy efficiency and the longest life possible out of those products. Well, we're all out of time for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again next time on today's Home Remodeling.